last week, uh, if you were here, uh, we, you were, we were on this Ephesians journey now. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. And a quick review is that we focused on the great spiritual blessings Christians enjoy. We are, number one, adopted as God's children. Number two, our sins are forgiven. Number three, we have become trophies of God's grace. And we have, number four, we've got the Holy Spirit. Four really good things. We did not, however, take time to explore what, what Paul sees as one more very important spiritual blessing. The fact that God has chosen and predestined us to be his children. Now, when, when many Christians hear the word predestination, the first that thought that comes to their mind is not spiritual blessing. Rather, the thought is often complicated, controversial teaching. And, and, and some of you might even be thinking, Pastor Dan, why are we going to talk about this today? You know we're never going to figure it out. Why do we want to just, let's go on to something else. Well, I must admit that I, I approach this subject with a, a bit of apprehension. Um, Norm Skur, who's teaching the What Did God Say Today class, said he couldn't hardly sleep last night thinking about the discussion that would ensue after this sermon. My, my goal is, is not to cause confusion and certainly not cause conflict. However, my job as your pastor is always, it's always to help you understand what does the Bible say? And, and what does that mean for our lives? That's what God has called me to do. And, and when we study the book of Ephesians, and, and when we're in chapter 1, it's really hard to ignore the topic of predestination because it pretty much hits us right in the face. I'll also add that it's probably not a good idea to ignore a, a particular biblical topic just because it's complicated or because it's controversial. Deuteronomy 29.29, 29, a lot of you know this verse, tells us the secret things belong to the Lord God. But <laughs> the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children. And yes, some of the people's, uh, the questions people have on this topic are questions that only God knows the answer. However, in this passage, and others the Lord has, and others, the Lord has revealed truth about predestination that I think he wants to use to strengthen our souls. And it, it may take some effort on our part, but hard thinking on hard topics of Scripture, when guided by the Holy Spirit, can produce rich rewards. Let me repeat that. The more I think about that, that's, that's good. That's a good thought. Hard thinking about hard topics. When, of Scripture, when guided by the Holy Spirit, can produce rich rewards. And again, you don't need a degree from seminary to do hard thinking about hard topics. You can do it. You can do it. Let's just pause and, and pray the Lord would enable us to understand his word. We're not going to understand it completely. I, I suspect some of you will leave this room with more questions today than, than when you came in, but that's okay because we want to, again, struggle with what, Lord, are you saying to us? What does this mean for us? Let's pray. Thanks, Father, for your word. Help us this morning to have the ability to hear and understand and believe your truth. And help us to realize what that truth means for our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. 
Okay, we, we start by just looking at what God says to us through the Apostle Paul. Uh, remember, the, these are God's words. We need to take them, them seriously. Our primary text is, again, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. We're not going to take time to read that passage. We did that a couple times last week. It is so, so good and so full of encouragement. The first thing I want to note is that Paul tells us that we, as Christians, have been predestined and chosen by God. I would say those two words, predestined and chosen, are really simply two sides of the same coin. They, they refer to the same truth. I, I sometimes talk to, to Christians who say, well, you know, Pastor Dan, I, I don't believe in predestination. And my response is, well, that's that's your right. This is America. You can choose to believe or not believe whatever you want. But if you do not believe in predestination, you can't really claim that you believe the Bible. Because there's no question, Scripture clearly teaches Christians have been predestined and chosen by God. And if you're skeptical about that claim, I can point to you to, you to numerous biblical passages but one place that is quite clear is right here in this chapter, Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. And then verse 11. In him we have an, obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Friend, if you believe the Bible is God's word, if you believe that what it teaches is true, <laughs> then I, I think you have to agree that we as Christians have been chosen and predestined. Now, we may not all agree with what that means, but you ought to acknowledge it is a fact. <laughs> I'm not sure I know exactly what it means, but the Bible does teach that Christians have been chosen and predestined by God. Secondly, I, I would note that the Apostle Paul tells us that being chosen and predestined is a good thing. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. In Ephesians uh, 1, he is praising God for choosing us, for predestining us. He says that it is out of love God has predestined us to be adopted as his children. Paul sees that as a beautiful truth to celebrate. And I think Paul would be quite puzzled by Christians who shy away from exploring this teaching on predestination because they're afraid that it's too complicated or, or somehow that it's an ugly truth. The fact that God has chosen us in Christ before the creation of the world, that he's predestined us to be adopted as his children, that's something which makes Paul shout, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! And if we don't share that response, it's probably because we don't understand predestination the same way that Paul does. And friend, if, if you're a Christian and, and you desire to believe and obey God's word, you maybe should pay closer attention to, to these verses and seek to understand why Paul is so excited about what he says. Okay. That brings us to the more difficult question. What does Paul mean when he says we've been chosen and predestined? We should all agree that we've been chosen and predestined. A little more difficult question is what does Paul mean by those terms? Well, let's step back and note that, that almost all Bible-believing Christians agree that Scripture teaches two important truths. Truths that at times will seem to be in conflict. The first truth is simply that God is sovereign. He rules the universe. 
He, Ephesians 1.11, works all things according to the counsel of his will. And according to Jesus, Matthew 10.29, there's not one single sparrow that falls to the ground apart from the Father's will. God is sovereign. The second truth is that, that we as human beings are responsible for choices we make. We are not robots simply doing what God has programmed us to do. Yes, we do make those choices under the umbrella of God's sovereignty, but, but they are still our choices. Uh, many like to say we have free will, though again, that's not a term the Bible uses. So the Bible teaches... Christians have been chosen and predestined by God to be his sons and his children. And it also says that Christians are those who are Christians. They're the ones who choose to trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. We are chosen by God. We choose God. How exactly do those two things fit together? I'm not totally sure. And neither are you, nor is anyone else sure exactly how they fit together. Uh, oh, the Bible does teach us important truth on these topics. It's not a complete mystery, but exactly, exactly how God's sovereignty and human responsibility fit together is something I think God alone understands. And thus, this is a topic we should approach and discuss with humility and, and graciousness as we all work together to seek to understand the truth God reveals. Over the centuries, Christians have basically ended up in, in two camps as they have thought about this issue. How does God's sovereignty and human responsibility, how do they fit together? Arminians emphasize human responsibility, you're the Arminians today, Calvinists emphasize God's sovereignty. Human responsibility, God's sovereignty. Now there is a third view referred to as corporate election, and this says Ephesians 1 is only talking about Christians being God's chosen people. Just as Israel was God's chosen people in the Old Testament, now Christians are God's chosen people, and God saves Christians, for example, instead of Hindus or Buddhists. He saves Christians. Well, that, that's true, but that's, I do not believe that's what Paul is talking about. Um, if you think, oh, that sounds like kind of a good interpretation, we should chat, because I don't think there's a whole lot to commend to that view. Anyway. So, we'll first consider the Arminian view that says God chooses those who he knows will choose him. There's a lot of other stuff involved in the Arminian view, but that's kind of the heart of it. Uh, God chooses those who he knows will choose him. Our choice. Our choice is the basis for his choice. Now, this view is not named after the country of Armenia, but rather after Jacob Arminius, uh, a prominent uh, Protestant reformer in the late 1500s. We have Arminians and Armenians. If that's all you learned today, it's been worthwhile, okay? <laughs> We're not talking about Armenians. Arminians. This view says that before the world began, God looked ahead to the future, and he saw all the people who would choose to accept Christ, and then he predestined those individuals to be his children. And thus, even though chronologically, yeah, God first chose us, he did so on the basis of the choice he knew we would make in the future. The verse these folks point to is Romans 8 29 where Paul says for those God foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son and our Arminians claim that this foreknowing God's foreknowledge of who will receive Christ determines who he predestines or chooses however 
in the Bible, it, it seems to me that God's foreknowledge involves much more than prediction. Uh, suppose last Sunday morning I would have said, the Packers will beat the Lions 35 to 17 this evening. And my prediction would have been correct. But it would have been a prediction I had absolutely zero influence on that happening. My sitting in front of the television cheering did not help anybody in that game. Okay? Had zero impact. My prediction had zero impact. On the other hand, if Aaron Rodgers would have predicted that score, he not only would have been correct about the score, but he would have had something to do with that score occurring. Friends, this is important. Listen. God is much greater than Aaron Rodgers. God is much greater than Aaron Rodgers. When God says something will happen, it happens. Not just because he knows it's going to happen, but he is going to ensure that it happens. He will make it happen if he has to. And that's what I think Paul means by, by foreknowledge. God obviously knew those he predestined would, would have faith. But, but this verse really says nothing about choosing them on the basis of who he knew would have faith. You know, what, one, one thing that strikes me as I, as I think about this is that God not only knew that I would become a believer in Jesus in 1969, Wow, that's a while ago, isn't it? 1969. But he also knew that I would believe in Jesus in the particular circumstances into which I was born and in which I lived. Acts 17.26 talks about we all end up where God intended us to end up. God not only knows who will receive and who will reject Christ in the world he created, but he also knows what everyone would have done if he had made the world differently. He not only knows who will believe in Jesus in this world that he created, he also knows what would have happened if he would have made it differently. If he would have put me in the mountains of Tibet rather than northern Wisconsin, would I be a believer in Jesus today? The point is that God's decision to create as he did almost certainly has an impact on our choices. Now, you could argue, well, God knew that you were going to choose to trust in Jesus, so he made sure you were born in Wisconsin and that you would hear the gospel message. And maybe, but at least in my mind, if, if, if God is making all these things based on what he knows I am going to do, we're getting dangerously close to salvation being something you deserve rather than salvation being by grace through faith in Jesus alone. So in, in, in summary, Ar Arminians believe we choose God and that's why he chose us. It's an appealing view for a variety of reasons held by some wonderful Christian people, including some good friends. However, I'm not convinced that is what the Bible teaches. So there's a second perspective that people have on this topic. It's usually called the, the Calvinist view associated with, with John Calvin, the, the Swiss reformer of the 1500s. It maintains we choose God. As Christians, we choose God. We put our faith in Jesus only because God has already chosen us. Thus, as Paul says, we are predestined to become Christians and be his children. Why, why did he choose us? <laughs> Calvinists answer, totally out of grace and for reasons beyond our comprehension. Grace is the part we know. <laughs> the other reasons we don't. Now, a lot of folks object to this view. They, they think it seems 
unfair maybe or it, it's arbitrary, contrary to, to human free will. And yet I have found that those objections often are rooted in a misunderstanding of what is being said. I think of uh, John Stott, well-known British pastor and, and author. He was once asked, Dr. Stott, are, are you a Calvinist? And he responded, well, well, yes, I am. But on second thought, he added, sir, what do you mean by Calvinist? And the man responded, well, a Calvinist is someone who believes that God takes people who want nothing to do with him and drags them kicking and screaming into heaven and tells others who are pounding on the gates of heaven, begging to enter, no, you can't come in because you have not been chosen. Stott replied, well, if that's what you mean by Calvinist, <laughs> then I am surely not one. And friend, if... if if that's what you think a Calvinist is, then no, I'm not one. And, and I might add, I doubt John Calvin was one either. Folks, I should not and do not want to believe and preach something because John Calvin or John Bunyan or Jonathan Edwards or John Piper or John MacArthur or any other John or anyone else does. I, I, I don't want to be bound to a, a human doctrine. I want to believe and, and preach what the Bible teaches. And your goal should be to hear and, and to believe what, what the Bible teaches. And it's your responsibility in this sermon and every, every, any sermon to prayerfully act 1711, listen to what I say, and then search the scriptures to see if these things are true. And on this topic, I'm convinced that salvation is rooted in the fact that God has chosen us, that he's predestined us in Christ before the foundation of the world. We choose him because he first chose us. Yes, it's still important for us to choose. We, we need to choose to believe or trust in Jesus. It's still our responsibility to, and privilege to tell anyone and everyone, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Well, how does that all fit together? Well, here's how I sometimes explain this. It's as if God hangs a banner, a, a banner over the gift of salvation that reads Revelation 22, 17, Come, let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take of the water of life freely. In other words, anyone who wants to come, come and receive this free gift of salvation. That's the invitation. And yet, because of our nature, our sinful nature, because of our pride and selfishness, because of our spiritual blindness, <laughs> we choose not to come and receive that salvation. If we would be left to ourselves, if we were left to ourselves, we would not come. Why do I think that? Because Romans 3.10 tells us there's no one who's seeking after God. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says the person without the Holy Spirit cannot understand spiritual truth. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 reads, the, the God of this world, Satan, Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. And Jesus says, John 6.44, no one comes to me unless the Father draws him. I believe that means if God had not chosen me before I was born, <laughs> I would not have chosen him after I was born. Now, did, did I know anything about this being chosen part before I trusted in Jesus? No, I, I didn't have a clue. It, it's only after we have trusted in the Lord Jesus and, and received his salvation that we are able to look back and realize that the other side of the banner says, chosen by God. You are the ones chosen by God before the foundation of the world. 
whosoever will may come, chosen by God before the foundation of the world. Folks, the bottom line is this. The biblical doctrine of predestination does not negate human responsibility. All who reject Jesus Christ and experience God's wrath and hell do so because that is their choice. Their choice. They have freely chosen to refuse the salvation God offers. And yet those who believe in Jesus, who receive God's salvation, have indeed chosen, been chosen by, they have indeed chosen God. Yes, they have made their decision. Yet the reason they made that choice, the reason they made that choice was because God opened their eyes. God gave them a thirst to know Jesus Christ. Even though they wanted nothing to do with Jesus, God enabled them to come. The Father drew them to himself. An old poem captures this truth. It reads, I sought the Lord, and afterwards I knew he moved my soul to seek him, seeking me. It was not I that found, O Savior, true. No, I was found by thee. Christians have different opinions on various aspects of what it means to be predestined or, or chosen by God. Yet it's important to recognize that Calvinists and, and Arminians and really all Bible-believing Christians should agree on basic truth concerning salvation. And, and this conversation, which once occurred between Charles Simeon, a, a London pastor, and, Char and John Wesley, brother was Charles John Wesley, the, the founder of the Methodist Church. This is, I think, instructive. Uh, Simeon said, uh, Mr. Wesley, I understand you are called an, an Arminian, and I am a Calvinist. Uh, I suppose we're supposed to draw verbal daggers. But before we argue, let me just ask you a few questions. Mr. Wesley, do you feel yourself a, a depraved creature who would have never thought of turning to God if, if he had not first put that in your heart? Wesley replied, well, yes, I do. And Mr. Wesley, do you believe there's nothing you can do to please God and, and look for salvation solely through the blood and righteousness of Christ? Wesley said, yes, solely through Christ am I saved. And Mr. Wesley, being saved through Christ, are you now somehow seeking to save yourself afterwards by your own works? No, Wesley replied, I, I must be saved by Christ from first to last. And Mr. Wesley, is all your hope in the grace of God to bring you to his heavenly kingdom? And Wesley replied, yes, I have no hope but in him. Charles Simeon then said, Mr. Wesley, I will then put away my dagger, for this is all my Calvinism, all my election, all my justification by faith, all my eternal security. Th that's all it involves, that we are saved by Christ from first to last. And so instead of searching for terms and phrases about which we can argue, let us cordially unite in those things in which we agree. Well, it's kind of, this is all kind of interesting, Pastor Dan. Maybe I'm confused, but it's, it's kind of interesting. What, but, but how does it have any practical relevance at all? Well, let me just tell you how, how as I've studied what the Bible teaches about predestination and, and God choosing us, this is two, these are two ways that I have been helped. Number one, it has helped me to become more humble, which is something I can use help with, still. Uh, there's a poster that shows a, a turtle sitting on top of a fence post, and the caption reads, I didn't get here by myself. As believers in Jesus, we should realize <laughs> we didn't get here by ourselves. God brought us into this family. It is by grace that our eyes have been opened to see the truth and beauty of the gospel. 
knowing that keeps me humble. If it was all about me choosing God rather than the other way around, then I might have something of which to be proud. Well, it was my intelligence that caused me to choose God. Or it was my nice personality that caused me to choose God. Or, or it was my, my good sense. That was why I trusted in Jesus. But I have nothing about which to boast. God saved me. I, I didn't help him achieve my salvation. God saved me. J. J. Vernon McGee used to tell the story. Some of you remember him on the radio. Hop on your Bible bus. Our, our Bible bus. Um, he used to tell a story of a young man who wanted to join the church, and so the deacons were interviewing him. And um, they asked, well, how did you get saved? And he answered, well, God did his part, and I did my part. And the deacons were a little nervous and thought his doctrine might be a little defective, so they asked, well, what was God's part and what was your part? He said, well, God's part was the saving my part was the sinning. I ran from God as fast as my sinful heart and, religion and, and rebellious legs could take me. And God ran after me until he caught me. That's my testimony. <laughs> Friends, the Apostle Paul would say that's, that's pretty good theology and that, because that was very much his testimony. He was heading to Damascus not because he was searching for God, <laughs> but because he wanted to oppose God in, every, in the church. But God ran after him and stopped him. I did not find God. I was found by him. For by grace, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you are saved through faith. And this, this, what is this? Well, it's the entire salvation process. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one, can boast. Secondly, I believe understanding predestination better gives us greater reason to praise and worship the Lord. Paul's words in this passage put me even more in awe of that awesome God. Ephesians 1.11, in him we've in, ob, obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. This is the God who determines the destiny of the nations. And he's the God who determines the destiny of the sparrows. And he determines the destiny of everything in between. He, he is the God whose plans are never thwarted. He, he is this, this awesome God, but a God who loves each of us as individuals. Folks, I, I, I believe God loves every human being, every human being, but he does not love the unbeliever in the same way he loves me and he loves you as his child. God loves his children in a different way than he loves those who are not believers. And knowing that fills me with joy and gratitude. Knowing that before the creation of the world, God chose me, Dan Erickson, birth date 05, 25, 1957, Social Security number 398, okay. I, I was just thinking, of those of you, you know, you're a little worried about the government and what they know, just remember God knew your Social Security number a billion years before the government ever existed. He knew that number. He knew, he, he knew me and said, he, th this guy, this individual, he will be my son. And I will love him with an everlasting love. Wow. And if you're a believer in Jesus, he said that about you. He will be my son. He will, she will be my daughter. 
And friend, if, if, you, if, you, if you know that God, yes, God has chosen me, uh, he's predestined me to be his child, then your heart, too, should be filled with gratitude and, and joy, which overflows in worship. And one day you will join a multitude in heaven declaring Revelation 7, 11, salvation belongs to our God. Not to us, it belongs to God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb.